As Canada's combat role in Afghanistan recedes, the costs are slowly being counted. Souls are mourned and wounds ministered. Now reports of suicide among demobilized troops is adding to these costs, raising questions about the public's commitment to caring for veterans after the shooting stops. Coming up, meet an author who recounts his battle with PTSD and his battle against the myths that surround it. Then get a military perspective on how to move the phrase support our troops from wartime platitude to peacetime pledge. This is Context, a look at life beyond the headlines. Past generations called it shell shock and countless thousands of soldiers suffered in silence. Today, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is recognized as the principal injury afflicting soldiers serving with the Canadian forces in conflict zones. Two retired officers, both diagnosed with PTSD, are going to help us understand a national crisis in caring for our soldiers and veterans. Lieutenant Colonel Chris Linford is in Victoria. He's author of Warrior Rising, which chronicles his journey with PTSD. He was deployed to Rwanda and Afghanistan. And Colonel Pat Stogren was Canada's first veterans ombudsman. He commanded forces in Bosnia and Afghanistan. He's joining us from Ottawa. Welcome both of you to Context. Thank you for Thank you. having me. Colonel Stolgren, let's start with you. With our soldiers coming home from Afghanistan now, it's estimated that up to 20% of those involved in operational combat will suffer from mental health issues. Do you believe we're ready to respond to that need? Absolutely, categorically not. You know, uh, when I was... The ombudsman, I was forecasting a tsunami of, uh, of problems uh, with the troops who have served over in Afghanistan that would be manifesting themselves somewhere downrange. And uh, I had no idea that we would have these, this rash of suicides this quickly. Uh, and we've seen that the, not only the bureaucracy, but the government is, uh, seems to be absolutely incapable of using any creative thought or any, any uh, um, judgment in uh, rectifying the problem. Okay, let's go to you, Lieutenant Colonel Linford. Um, we've got 24 centers across the country serving veterans. We've got uh, seven operational stress places for them. You yourself had to step down from commanding due to PTSD. You know the emotions of suicide. You've written about it in your book. Is it as bleak as Colonel Stogren is finding on getting help for our veterans? Yeah, I, I certainly recognize what uh, Colonel Stogren says, and I, I do worry about whether there are enough resources in place. Um, I can only, I can speak from my personal experience in that the two times that I uh, reached out and asked for help, the first time in 2004, some 10 years after my deployment to Rwanda when I actually got PTSD, and then recently uh, in 2010 when I came home from Afghanistan, I reached out again. Both of those times, um, resources were available for me. Um, and uh, indeed, the mental health clinics that I was exposed to, the first one in Borden, then in Edmonton and here in Victoria, they are busy, busy places, let me tell you. Um, so that, but, you know, in, in a sense, it's, it's a good thing that they're busy because that to me means that veterans are stepping forward. Because for the longest time, and I, I think uh, that speaks to the situation after World War II, when veterans came home, we didn't really know what we didn't know about PTSD. Uh, it was certainly no driving force to step forward and talk about it. It was very much a suck it up, Nancy uh, policy, and get on with life, and just don't talk about that stuff. I mean, we all know veterans from the first war, from the second war, and uh, Korea that just never, ever talked about it. The Department of National Defense does not track the suicides among reservists or retired soldiers. But if you look at the stats in the United States, uh, where twice as many veterans have taken their own lives since serving in the Vietnam War than the number of those killed in battle. Uh, Pat Stogren, what do the numbers not tell us? What are, what, what's, what's the underlying need here in Canada? 
Um, you know, I, I think first and foremost, what the Canadian Forces has to do is the chain of command has to take on responsibility for these casualties, and they have to be viewed in the exact same light as a uh, battlefield casualty laying ble bleeding on the plains of Kandahar. And they have to be held accountable for uh, people who slipped through the cracks. You know, Chris summed it up. He reached out. He reached out twice. The problem with many people that suffer from uh, um, psychological illnesses is that they don't reach out. So many of our veterans right now are not self-identifying as even having a problem. And that's the biggest issue right there is for them to overcome the stigma of all this. Um, I think that the, you know, I, I've, I've spoken with the current CDS and, and chief of military personnel as well. And, and frankly, I'm impressed with the new frame of mind and the new forward thinking of how can we really reach out and get veterans to actually come forward and actually uh, recognize that they do have an issue. Is that the crux of the problem? Negative. Not at all. You know, uh, they still have what they call uh, the... Uh, integrated personnel support units, and I I've spoken to soldiers, people who have been sent over there, and one characterized that organization as the island of the misfit toys. Uh, how do you re uh, get rid of a structure, uh, a stigma rather, when you uh, say to a, a snake-eating, war-fighting soldier that you're broken and you're going to go to the island of misfit toys? They should stay in the units, they should be gainfully employed in any capacity uh, that they can, and it should be incumbent on the chain of command, not the medical system, not the OSI clinics. Uh, it, it should be incumbent on the chain of command. This is a force protection issue. And anybody that leaves the Canadian forces and is subsequently lost to veteran affairs, the chain of command is culpable. Wow, so don't ever let a wounded soldier with PTSD, and I, and I mean a mentally wounded soldier, leave rank until he's better. Now, universality of service is a dead issue as far as I'm concerned. It was brought up in, a, in an era where we used to strap a piece of firewood onto a limb and, and have people cope with it. The Canadian Forces has to recognize that during force reconstitution after a major operation, force protection is still in effect and they have to look after these battlefield casualties. Okay. I think that's, I think that's right, Pat, but I, the, the unfortunate thing is at the strategic level, I believe they truly understand this concept, but at the at the lower leadership rev levels, it's still not widely understood. But you know, and Chris, the, and the support for veterans is is still pretty tough there. It's leadership. The stigma. Uh, I it, don't accept that. Right. Leader, leadership, leadership has to transcend the operational, the strategic, and the tactical level, and it's leadership by example. So cheesy public service announcements that aren't enough. Memos, you cannot change a culture by, by putting out memos. It takes leadership. It takes the top brass getting down with the section commanders okay. and, and talking to the uh, casualties. We need to save time on this program for um, two very powerful stories of veterans who are, uh, are living uh, this and continue to fight this battle. Both of you, thank you very much. And uh, Colonel Pat Stogren, Canada's first veterans ombudsman and ongoing advocate for soldier care, thank you very much. Lieutenant Colonel Chris Linford, National Ambassador for Wounded Warriors, thank you very much. Well, when we come back, living and dying with PTSD. We'll learn from a husband whose wife committed suicide and a veteran who receives hospital treatment for PTSD. Both join us next.